intergalactic bar and grill, like every other dive club in the seedy section of the Orion Arm, a flickering neon sign promising cheap booze and easy company for weary astronauts looking to forget their problems for a night indoors. The air hung thick with smoke and the pheromones of a dozen different alien species. That would make Venusia the skunk poor. But for Sergeant Jake Mad Dog McGraw, recently retired from the Terran Defense Force, it smelled like home, nice home. Jake leaned back on the bar stool, his muscle mass tugging at the seams of his faded uniform. He lifted a glass of rotgut whiskey to his lips and enjoyed the burn as the drink slid down his throat, just as the doctor had ordered. One pointless day in his pointless civilian life. Eh, the bartender hit me again. Jack growled, slamming the empty glass onto the sticky countertop and turning it into a double. It's one of those days when the alien clucks its tentacles behind the bar, presumably as a token of appreciation, and with surprising dexterity, takes another drink to the creature without thumbs. Jack watched as the amber liquid sloshed into his glass and felt a familiar ache settle in his chest. Damn, he had missed this fight, missed the adrenaline rush of combat, missed the camaraderie of the team, and missed the sense of mission to defend humanity from hostile forces. In the hollow photo, he always leans on an empty beer glass. The photo shows two young men fighting, armored arms slung over each other's shoulders, grinning like idiot Jack and his best friend Zoltan, good old Zoltan. The finest soldier Jake had ever served with and a truer friend than any human. They had been through hell together, from the siege of Beetlejuice to the Scar Royan meat grinder, saving each other's lives more times than Jake could count. But in the end, not even the mad dog McGraw could save Zoltan from the enemy, who eventually claimed him. Large species of sea Zolan are particularly susceptible to canker, and by the time they catch it, it is too late. He had lost so much weight that he had nothing left. Months later, leaving Jack alone in a galaxy colder and emptier than ever, Jack tossed his drink and gestured to the other, cursing Zoro for dying, damn, and the doctors for not saving him. The universe is so cruel, but the most important thing is that when a better person dies, he himself is still alive. Leanne placed another glass of whiskey in front of him, and Jack eagerly reached for it. But before the glass reached his lips, a firm hand grabbed his wrist. I think you've had enough, Michael, stern voice said. Your grief won't bring Sultan Jake back. He looked up hazily to find himself staring into the steel-gray eyes of a ram-dressed, inexpensive business suit. The man was of medium height and built with nondescript features. It was a face you forgot when I looked away but there was something about his manner that made Jack's experienced eyes wonder who he really was. You asked Jack, trying to free his hand, but the man's grip was like Ezekiel Cain's in The Lawyer. The man replied with a flickering, humorless smile, On behalf of the legacy of your late friend Zoltan, I'm afraid I have some rather urgent matters to discuss with you, Sergeant McGraw. Should you wish to join me, go ahead and ask Jack to look at his puzzling property. What the hell did that have to do with him? But before he could protest... Ezekiel Kane firmly guided him to the exit, one hand still on his arm, and they walked out into the neon night. Jack has a strong feeling that his life is about to get more complicated, and this time the whiskey churning in his gut has nothing to do with it. The cable car glides through the night, its sleek black exterior reflecting the blinding light of the red light district. Ezekiel Kane sat up straight with his hands in his lap. The lawyer had barely said a word since Jack was packed into the limousine, and his silence was starting to annoy Jack. Well, leak it, and Jack broke the tense silence with a growl. What the hell is going on? What does Zahn's happiness have to do with me? I supported him with another useless smile. Be patient, Sergeant McGraw. All will be revealed in time. Jack S. He was taking the exam but still gritted his teeth and held back the line that he blurted out. He had a hunch that angering this guy wouldn't be a good idea. The limo banked smoothly, leaving the seedier parts of town behind. They were now heading uptown towards the glittering towers of the financial district. Jake watched the cityscape rush by, a sense of unreality washing over him. What the hell was he doing here in this fancy-ass car? With this fancy-ass lawyer, he was just a grunt, a retired soldier, with no prospects and no future. He does not belong to this world of wealth and power. Finally, the limousine slowed down at a towering earring skyscraper, that appeared to be made entirely of glass and chrome and pulled up to the headquarters of the Kane and Kane Law Firm. According to the discreet gold lettering above the int we've arrived, Kane announced unnecessarily. As a livery doorman hurried to open the limo door, Jake climbed out, feeling shabby and out of place in his rumpled uniform. He followed Kane into the building's opulent lobby, trying not to gawk at the soaring ceilings and gleaming marble floors. They took a private elevator to the penthouse, 
and Kane led him into a corner office with floor-to-ceiling windows offering a stunning view of the city. The room is tastefully furnished in leather and dark wood, and the walls are lined with bookshelves made of real paper. Jack couldn't remember the last time he had seen so many dead trees in one place. Please sit down. It can be said that in front of his desk signals the rich backrest chair. Can I give you coffee? Maybe I'll drink whiskey. To his surprise, Jack simply nodded and walked over to the corner bar, which was well stocked. He poured two glasses of the amber liquid into cut crystal glasses, handed one to Jack, and sat down behind Zoltan's desk. Kane said as he raised his glass in a toast. A true friend and hero to the end, Jake swallowed hard and tossed the drink back as he felt the burn of the expensive drink on the Sultan. He repeated it like a horse. Kane set his glass aside and took a sip. His fingers locked on Jack with a sharp look. Sergeant McGraw, I'll get down to business. Zoran left most of his wealth to you, and Jack's heart sank at the thought of his will. He may have been a pitiful scoundrel, but he was not heartless. He couldn't let some poor alien suffer because of his selfishness. Very well, he said through broken teeth. I want to remove the damn money and wife, but I won't expect you to be happy about it. June's smile is thin and sharp, like I never dreamed it could be when I was razor sharp. Sergeant McGraw. If you'd like to sign here, he pushed the stack of papers across the table, and Jack reached for his pen in a grim retreat. Whether he likes it or not, it looks like his pointless civilian life is about to get a lot more interesting. The Voltarian widow was called Zana, and she was perhaps the most beautiful being. Jake had once watched. She stood in the center of Zona's beautiful living room, her slender body draped in a shimmering silver fabric. It hugged her curves like a second skin. Her skin was lavender, and her hair was iridescent black and fell to her waist just below her eyes. Her eyes were large almond-shaped, with a surprising amber color that seemed to sparkle from within, but the sadness in those eyes struck Jack like a physical shock, and Zalana could have been sweet and all, but also clearly sad. She was preceded in death by her husband, Sergeant McGraw. She said in a low voice and musically, It's an honor to meet you. She lowered her head, and Jack was speechless. What should he say to this woman? Sorry, your husband is drunk, but hey, I guess you're with me now. Also, he mumbled, feeling like, Oh, hey, please call me Jake Zeeland. He bowed his head again, but said nothing. An awkward silence fell between them, broken only by the ticking of the antique clock on a mantelpiece. Jack cleared his throat and tried to say something. This is a nice place. Zoltan was here. It was an understatement. The penthouse is a palace. All the gleaming marble, priceless art, and furniture that probably cost more than Jack made in his entire military career. He felt like a bull in a china shop, afraid to touch anything lest he break it. Zoltan had exquisite taste, and Zelda accepted her gaze distantly. He filled our home with beauty, just as he filled my life with joy. Her voice caught in the last word, and Jake saw her lower lip tremble before she pressed her fingers to her mouth. Fighting for composure, hell Jake, might be emotionally stunted, but even he could see the woman was hurting before he could think better of it. He crossed the room and laid a tentative hand on her. Shoulder hey, it's okay, he said roughly. I know you miss him. I miss her too. Zeeland looked up at him, tears filling her amber eyes. Did she whisper to you? Jake really swallowed hard, yes? He said hey, Zolan was the best damn friend I ever had when I lost her. It was like losing a part of myself. A tear slid down his cheek, and Jack reached out to wipe it away with his thumb without thinking, her skin feeling incredibly soft and smooth from his struggle. Fingers have been rough for a long time. They stared at each other for a strangely tense moment that Jack couldn't understand. Then Zeeland stepped back, breaking the spell. Sorry, she said her voice made me up again. I don't mean to give you the burden of my sadness, McGrady Chinese. You've already done more than enough by agreeing to fulfill Zahn's last wishes. Jake shrugged uncomfortably. I'm not doing it for him. He said straight up, I'm doing it for you. No offense, but I don't want his money or his clever digs. I just don't want to see you get busted by your own government. Zillia's eyes widened in surprise, then softened in gratitude. You are a good man, Jack McGraw, she said gently. Zorro chose a good heir. Jack hissed, I'm not the heir. He said roughly, I sure as hell am not a good man, but I will do right by you. Zalana, I promise you, smiled the small sad curve of her lips that nevertheless lit up her whole face. Believe you, she just said, I'm grateful. She turned and gazed out the floor-to-ceiling windows at the glittering cityscape, and Jack felt a strange tightness in his chest as he looked at her. 
How exactly has he gotten himself into? And how can he navigate this new reality without screwing it up any worse than he's already been through? But one thing's for sure, he won't let Zeeland down in all of this. She's been through it ever since. He owed Zolan that much, at least with a sigh. Jake turned to pour himself another drink from the Zone Well bar. It was a long night. The following weeks passed in a fog of legal paperwork and cultural misunderstandings. Jack enters a world of wealth and privilege. He had never thought about it, let alone experienced it. Zorn's estate was extensive and included not only a penthouse but also extensive country estates, a fleet of luxury cars, and a dizzying array of investments and business interests. Jake's responsible person rotates because he is trying to be seriously dependent on lawyers and financial consultants. Zolan remained, but even if he tried to adapt to his new reality, he couldn't help but be attracted to Zlana. The Voltarian widow was a constant presence in his life, now overseeing the household staff and managing the day-to-day -day affairs of the estate with quiet. Grace and efficiency left Jake in awe. She was also a mystery. Her exotic beauty and grace brought Belling's deep sorrows, which Jake longed to understand. But every time he tried to get closer to her as Alana, it seemed like he was retreating behind a polite, formal wall. It was crazy. Jack wasn't used to being shut out, especially from the women he found. One evening, Jack stumbles home after a night of drinking with some old teammates. But when he went upstairs, he found Zeeland waiting for him in the living room. Her amber eyes crossed her arms, and she blinked in anger at where you were. She demanded in a shrill voice of frustration, in her usually melodious voice, and Jack winked at her as his brain struggled to process it in the alcohol haze. As soon as her words came out, he said them stupidly to some friends. Zilly's nostrils flared. You didn't think to tell me you were planning to leave any contact information in case of an emergency. Jack was angry at her tone. I don't know that I need your license to go out. He last tested. I am a grown man. You are also the head of the family. Now Ziana objects. You have a responsibility. Jack has a responsibility. You can't disappear into the night without saying a word. Jack smiled bitterly. What obligation did he have to sit in this damn bar? I pretend I don't like dealing with rich people who aren't mad at me. If I got burned, he took a step towards her and narrowed his eyes to talk about Zalana's commitments. What are your responsibilities to me as my wife? How dare you? She whispered, her voice trembling with anger and something else, something that might have been fear. I might want to be bought or sold. Jack McGraw. I'm a man who feels and wants his anger. Jack's anger dissipates as quickly as it comes, leaving him in shame and uttering self-loathing. Sorry, he said, running his hands through his hair. I don't mean it. I just don't know what to do. Zilly's expression softened the anger in her eyes, which were replaced by understanding ones, and I knew she was whispering, Jack, I'm sorry too. I'm not being fair to you. This situation is difficult for both of us. She takes a step toward him. Her hand rests tentatively on his chest, but whether we like it or not, we're together. It's not like we have to find a way to make it work. Jack swallowed hard, his heart pounding at her touch. What should we do? He asked Mazian, looking up at him, her amber eyes dark and evasive. We start by being honest with each other, she said, quietly trusting each other and assuming that everything between us is real, and that means something. Jake looked down at her, his breath coming faster green. He grunted with his hand and reached for her cheek, but before he could say more, a sudden explosion rocked the building, shattering the windows and sending the two flying jacks crashing to the ground hard. His fighting instincts kicked in as he rolled, searching through the smoke and debris for the source of the attack. He saw a group of heavily armed figures, their faces obscured by tactical helmets, rush into the penthouse, and at that moment Jack knew with more certainty that his past had finally caught up with him, and that Zalana would soon be caught. In the crossfire... Reacting only on instinct, Jack's body moved in front of his mind, fully processing the threat he posed to Zalana, pinning her to the ground just as a burst of fire from the explosion ripped through her stance. He growled and covered her body with his, reaching for the pulse gun strapped to his ankle, and to his credit, he didn't scream or panic. She simply nodded with wide eyes but resolutely pressed herself against the marble floor. Jake appeared from behind the shattered remains of the coffee table and fired a few shots at the nearest attacker. The man went down with a cry. His armor was no match for the high-powered rounds, but there were more of them pouring into the penthouse like a swarm of angry hornets. Jake cursed under his breath, knowing he was outgunned and outmanned. He needed to keep Zalana safe, but the way his eyes fell to a private lift, just a few feet away, if he could get them inside, 
they could escape the garage level and pick up one of Zoltan's armor hover cars on Zolana. When I said, go to the elevator, he said it urgently, thrusting the gun into her hand. I'm guarding you. She nodded, her fingers wrapping around a weapon, her confidence surprising him. Perhaps there is more to the identity of Walt's widow than meets the eye. When Jack breathed deeply, when the attacker threw against him, he covered the lid. He was confused about his benefits, left and right. He yelled, and Zelana sprinted towards the elevator with grace and speed, and Jake in his flowing cloak cast a suppressive fire and took down the other two attackers before a searing pain shot through his shoulder. He found the edges of his vision turning gray. When he felt blood on his hand, he could not stop the clean adrenaline. He rushed to the remaining attackers, just like Ares, whom people beat. They went down the limb and weapons to the turmoil, and Jake felt wildly satisfied with hearing the crispness of the bone. He boarded the elevator, and just as the door closed, he collapsed against the wall when Zalana pressed the garage level button. She turned to face him, her eyes widening in alarm as she saw blood soaking his shirt, and you hurt. She said her voice tight with worry. He gritted his teeth to hold back the pain and waved her away. He wasn't lying. We have to get out of here. Quickly. They backed it up in a way that made Zalana look like she was going to argue. But the elevator dinged and the door opened to the great room of the garage, and Jack straightened up, scanning the rows of shiny vehicles for the one he wanted, the garden. Car. Jet black, all streamlined lines and reinforced armor. Zorn's pride and joy, a fortress on wheels. Get in, he said, stumbling to the driver's side. We have to keep some distance from this place. Zalana slipped into the passenger seat. Her face is pale, but a composed Jake pulled behind the wheel. His eyesight swam as he muttered the ignition as the car roared to life, and he threw his foot to the accelerator and sent them to the exit. They burst into the streets in screeching tires and swathed in a neon haze like a bat out of hell. White, hot pain shot through Jack's shoulder, and he felt consciousness slip from Jack's grasp. You need medical attention, Zalana said urgently, placing a hand on his arm. Let me drive. He shook his head, blinking stubbornly and sweating in his eyes, and couldn't help but mutter that it wasn't safe. But as he said it, he felt the world tilt and spin around him. The blood loss and adrenaline rush hit him like a freight train. The last thing he saw before darkness was gold in his face. Amber's eyes shone with a fierce and determined light. Then he fell into darkness, unaware that Jack had been awakened by a soft hum and the gentle press of fingers against his skin. The bright light seemed to hit his skull, and he blinked and frowned. Where is he? What happened? It all came together. I rushed back to the attack in the penthouse, desperate to escape the searing pain in my shoulder. He stood up suddenly, ignoring the wave of dizziness that came over him as a familiar voice spoke and turned to see Zealand sitting next to him. With a damp cloth in hand, you're safe. Now he looked around, taking in the unfamiliar surroundings. They were in some kind of underground bunker, the walls lined with weapons and supplies, a makeshift medical bay set up in one corner, and he suddenly realized he was lying on a small bed with clean white bandages wrapped around his shoulders. Where are we? He asked in a gruff voice. Safe house, Zealand replied, pressing a cup of water into his hand, one of the Zanes. He installed it years ago. In an emergency, Jake took a deep drink of the cool liquid that soothed his parched throat. I haven't been out much in two days, Zalana said softly. You've lost a lot of blood, Jack, and I'm not sure you're going to survive, he stared at her, suddenly realizing what she meant. You saved my life, he said slowly. You got us out of there and found this place. Fill it out for me. She ducked her head in a faint flush, coloring her lavender skin. I did what I had to do. She said simply what any good wife would do. Jack suddenly felt emotional. His breasts were swollen, and he had nothing to do with the injury. He spoke and put her hand in land, and he said, I don't know what to say. It seems that gratitude is not enough. She looked up at him, her amber eyes soft and warm. No words were needed. Just relax, she whispered. We have a lot to discuss, but it can wait until you get stronger. Jack wanted to argue and demand answers about the attack and their current situation. But her soft pressure on him was too comforting, and she couldn't resist. As he went over to sleep, he heard Zilly's voice, Lutty's cradle sang low and sweet, seemed to be packed around him like a warm hug. And for the first time, he remembered longer than he remembered. Jake felt a glitter of peace that maybe only everything was fine when he woke up hours or days later. Zalana had disappeared and had a small hand device with a flashing message. The light Jake picked it up for his forehead. His heart stuttered in his chest as he read the words on the screen. 
Jack, my love, if you're reading this, I'm sorry to leave without saying goodbye, but I can't risk it. It puts you in more danger. In fact, the attack on the penthouse was not a random act of violence. This was a targeted assassination by the same people who killed Zutten, and now they know about you and us. They won't stop me until we're both dead. This must not be allowed to happen. Jack, I will not make you pay for the sins of my family, so I will finish what Zoran started and end it once and for all. I just hope that one day, you will be able to forgive me and remember me. No matter what happens, I will always love you. Always be yours, Zolana. Jack stared at the words until they blurred before his eyes, and a cold, hollow feeling settled in his heart. She was left alone to face her enemy while he was trapped here, wounded and helpless, but not for long, grunting in pain. He got up from the bed, his jaw set. No matter what the cost, he would find her, fight with her, and together they would make the bastards who tore their lives pay. It was time for Sergeant, Jake, Mad, and Dom McGraw to live up to his name once more, and heaven help. Anyone who stood in his way, Jake, moved through the safe house like a man, his mind racing as he gathered supplies and weapons. He knew he didn't have to pay, but Zlana had encountered the enemy's thoughts to move his pain forward. I was unlikely to realize that the man was looking at him. His face was tired and pale. There was a shadow in his eyes that had nothing to do with physical exhaustion. But in those eyes, there was a burning fire forged in the crucible of war, tempered by loss and love. He strapped on his armor the familiar weight of the ballistic plates, a comfort against his skin. He checked his weapons, the sleek lines of the pulse rifle and the extension of his own body. And then he was moving, striding out of the safe house and into the neon-lit night, his jaws set and his heart pounding with a single unshakable purpose. He will find Zlan, and he will still take him home. The city streets were a blur of light, shadow, and sound, with hover carts and gunners weaving between the towering skyscrapers like glowing insects of the enemy. He didn't know where to start looking for Shauna, but he knew someone who might be an old contact from his military days, someone who had his finger on the pulse of the city's underworld. Although the odds were slim, it was his only lead. The meeting was arranged in a pub on the outskirts of town, where the drinks were cheap and the customers were dangerous. Jack slipped into a booth, rested his hand on the butt of the gun, and waited for his contact to arrive. He didn't have to wait long. A figure slipped into the seat across from him, his hood pulled low over his face. He had been a mad dog for a long time. The man said in his voice, whispering, you've gone peacefully playing with that cute Voltarian dude. His jaw clenched, but he kept his voice. Even I need information. Rex, I need to find the person who killed Zoran and stormed the attic. Rex's eyes sat and sparkled in the low light, which makes you think I don't know anything about it because you're Jack. The cockroach put it bluntly, survived knowing what's going on in this city, and because I'm ready to pay, he slid the credit card chip across the table and watched our ex fingers wrap around it. The man put the chip in his pocket and leaned forward. Quietly, there is a new player in town. He says that a really nasty job known as Zorn has moved into Zoltan's old turf to try and take over his business interests, that he has some powerful forces backing him up. Jake's heart skipped a beat, he repeated. Who is he? Where can I find him? What do you mean? I think he's always looking. She says she's the key to some Voltri secret that can make him invulnerable. And while he's willing to do anything to get her Jack's blood, Zolana is in more danger than she is. He understood it. He must find her before Zorn. He got up from his chair and mopped the floor. Thanks for the message. Rex, I owe you one. The man grinned, his teeth glinting in the dark. Damn, you must be a crazy dog. I'm always chasing debts. Jack, before he could speak, he was already thinking of his next move. He now has a name and a purpose. All he needed was a location, and he knew where to start. Watch as the Volta Embassy loomed before Jack, a gleaming tower of glass and steel, its spears reaching toward the sky like clenched fingers. He knew that somewhere in that labyrinth of a structure, Solana was fighting for her life, and he walked to the entrance, his pulse rifle at the ready, the guards at the door, and a couple of giant Voltarians men eyed him dubiously as he came to a stop. One of them barked with his hand based on the position of his own weapon. Your host Jack smiled lightly. I am here to meet Ambassador Zorn. He said it in a voice as cold as ice. We had some unfinished business to discuss, and the security guard exchanged glances. Then the speaker nodded. During this time, the ambassador did not receive tourists. He said firmly that I should ask you to leave Jack's smile, but there is no humor. I didn't ask, he said softly. 
He moved so fast that his eyes couldn't keep up with the roar of the pulse rifle. And as the guards pressed their chests to the ground, smoke rising from the point-blank shots, Jack stepped over their bodies. His boots creaked on the broken door warning and began to be deafening. He asked to find Lana. There is no other significance. He passed through the embassy like a ghost and was ready. His weapons felt like any dangerous context. He encountered resistance. Almost immediately, Voltarian guards were pouring out of every doorway in the corridor, but they were no match for his training, his skill, or his sheer, unrelenting determination. He cut through them like a scythe through wheat, leaving a trail of broken bodies in his wake. His armor diverted their shots. His own goal is true and deadly. He felt a wild joy at the violence, a dark thrill at knowing he was one step closer to his goal, and then suddenly there he was. The ambassador's office, an extremely opulent room that smelled of power and privilege and was fronted by a large desk, was green. She ran into the tall and impressive Walt. His face was cruel and arrogant. Zorn Jake knew instinctively the man who had orchestrated all of this and who had torn their lives. Apart from his own twisted ends, Ziana was speaking her voice low and urgently. You don't understand what she was saying. The main thing is not the thing. It's a person. When the guy entered the room, her eyes in shock and fear of Jack broke. What are you doing here? He chuckled and pointed his pulse rifle at Zoro. I'm here to do it. He said his voice a low death growl or a cold sneer that made Jack grit his teeth. You really think you can stop me, human? He sneered that I was more powerful than you could possibly imagine. I have the support of the entire Voltaire government and the resources of dozens of worlds at my disposal, and you are not a relic of a bygone era a pitiful remnant of a dying race. Jake's finger tightened on the trigger. Maybe that's what he said quietly, but I'm a relic that will put a hole in your head. If you don't let him go, Zorn's eyes narrowed his hand, and he fell to the weapon at his side. Not shy to try, he hissed, and then all hell broke loose. Free Zorn's body moved in a blur of speed and power. Jake fired the pulse rifle in his hands, but the Voltarian was too fast and too strong. He hit Jack like a freight train, sending him across the room and into the far wall. Jack struggled to his feet, his head pounding, and his vision blurry. He saw Zahn's face covered in a mask of horror as the Zorn grabbed her by the throat and lifted her up. He fingered the key as he tightened his hand to me or watched her loved one die. The Zahn's eyes met Jake's silent plea in deep amber, and in that moment, he knew the key was nothing. It was her own Zeelin, the last living heir to the throne of Volta, who could reveal the secrets of her people power that Zorn so craved, and who would die before her. Let him have it. Jack felt a calm wash over him, cold, clear certainty that erased the pain and fear, and he knew what he had to do. He let out a low cry of anger and defiance, his eyes widening in surprise, but it was too late. The force of Jack's thrust slammed into him, causing both men to fall to the ground. Their limbs entwined together, and they rolled to the floor as Zorn clenched with inhuman strength and screamed before his eyes but he didn't want to make the final decision. He wrenched himself from Zorn's grasp, his hand wrapping around the hilt of the Voltarian's own knife. He raised the glowing blade and drove it into Zor's chest again and again, Walt's eyes twitching in shock and pain. He let out a strangled grunt, blood spurting from the wound in his chest, and then unsteadily rose to his feet, his body still limping against Jack's own. His chest heaved from the aftershock of the blow, and his body shook. He turned his eyes to seek Zalana. She was there, her face trembling with tears, and her eyes shone with a hard, proud light. She ran to him, threw her arms around him, and hugged him tightly. You came to me. She whispered against his chest. You saved me. Jack watched her with his own eyes. Tears stung. I will always come to you. He whispered. No matter what, I love you, Celiana, more than life itself. She looked at him. Her smile was brighter than any son I had ever known and she simply said, I love you, Jack McGraw, forever. They stood there, holding each other, as the world around them faded away. They had won against all odds. They had each other, and that was all that mattered. As they walked out of the embassy hand in hand, Jake knew that whatever the future held, they would face it together, for they were more than just husband and wife. They're not just lovers. They're warriors bound together by an unbreakable love, and together they can face anything. The universe can throw them their way.